And now to pick up on some of those issues raised in our first panel and for further industry insider analysis, I'm joined by Rebecca Gunten, Head of Region Europe for Sandoz. Rebecca, welcome. Let's touch now on COVID, what an impact it's had on all of us and our health in the last year. So what learnings would you say the pandemic has given for the future of healthcare delivery? Well, of course, COVID had a huge impact on, on all of us, and it really has redefined what we would call normal. And it has really tested the resilience of us as individuals of the society and healthcare systems. If I look at COVID, and if you ask me about the learnings, I would say it has really highlighted and accelerated a couple of points which have been on, on the agenda actually before. So for example, if we look at uh, priorities and um, political agendas, we have seen a huge attention when it comes to supply chain resilience. And working in the generic industry, this is absolutely core what we do. So our top priority is always to drive access to medicines for patients. And this said, I think we have been able to meet unparalleled demands uh, during the peak of the crisis because we immediately implemented um, business continuity plans, but of course also a very strong cross-industry collaboration, which was absolutely great to see. And this said, I think moving now out of COVID, we're going to see a huge pressure on healthcare budgets. And this also said, if you link it back to supply chain resilience, by default, you would look into price reductions, but it's gonna be equally important to balance price, quality, and availability of medicines. The other one is, I think we see a renewed global focus on infectious diseases, but also uh, public health, including vaccination and, and antibiotics. And we are really realizing those are life-saving medications. And I'm pleased to say and to see that Sandus has given a commitment to go for investments into Kundal, which is the last fully integrated production and manufacturing side of antibiotics in Europe. And then the last point, uh, also referring on our future of work and digitalization. So I think I was really impressed how fast we have been moving to remote working and also the way we engaged with our customers during uh, COVID. So if you think this true, I personally believe there's a lot which is gonna remain uh, and to stay. And the question we have now to ask ourselves, so how do we leverage digital technology uh, to drive value for patients and customers, but also efficiencies in the healthcare system? Maybe one last point where we need to improve um, and where there is really need to address it is the continuity of care. Because COVID has shown us there's a huge backlog when it comes to treatment and diagnosis. And, and this said, of course, uh, to give you an example, we see that biopsies are dropping by 60% and also a delay in surgeries by 70%. So those are quite big numbers. And, and moving now out of COVID, um, of course, that's gonna bring a massive burden, an economic burden to the healthcare services. And it needs really serious decisions at the top level to address those backlogs. And some really important points you make there about the focus on collaboration and the importance of access for all. Uh, so what would you say then in terms of the decision makers that you refer to there, the big decisions that lie ahead, with some light at the end of the tunnel from seeing vaccines rolling out, from seeing the learnings that have come from there, what now would you say would be on the priority list for healthcare decision makers? And is there a way in that biosimilars can help healthcare systems get back on track? Yeah, the first priority, of course, is vaccination, because that's the only thing who is going to bring us back to a more normal life, right? And the other one, which I was just mentioning, we need to address the backlog when it comes to diagnosis and treatment. So referring to the UK, to bring another example, we see that over 2 million of, of patients are in backlog for cancer um, care, uh, which is, which is uh, really amazing to see that the number is so big. And of course, if you ask me about biosimilars, they can be part of the solution because they drive access while also delivering savings to the healthcare system. And the good news is I think biosimilars are really now proven cost-effective treatments because we just have celebrated 15 years of biosimilars in Europe. 
So imagine we have 60 biosimilars now available in Europe, and we talk about 2 billion of patient days. So a quite significant experience when it comes to biosimilars. But this said, and, and this is the part where we have still a huge potential to unlock, we do see quite a gap when it comes to adoption, but also to usage of biosimilars across the countries. So if you compare Nordics, where we see adoption rates of above 90%, if you move more Eastern Europe, um, like Poland, less than 1% of the population have access to biologics. And, and this is a gap we need to really close to, to ensure equality of access to healthcare across Europe and even beyond. So yes, biosimilar in a nutshell, if we are able to unlock the potential, they can really contribute to accelerate post-COVID recovery, to drive and, and we'll say facilitate also sustainability of healthcare systems, and last but not least, really improve the quality of healthcare around the globe, basically. So you touched there on the gap, the disparity across different countries in terms of access to biosimilars. And of course, biosimilars are not used across all disease therapy areas. So what, what measures are needed to address any gaps in order to, to drive forward the uptake and indeed creation of new biosimilars? Well, the good news uh, to start with is we're seeing a lot of good practices coming from the countries and also initiatives um, ongoing. And I'm very pleased that the European Commission has adopted um, those points and also integrated. So how can they further uh, drive adoption of biosimilars and also address quality of access to biosimilars in their pharmaceutical strategy? But also if you think about the beating cancer plan, so a lot of points are addressed in, in those papers. And of course, we now need to see what measures are going to be taken and what decisions are going to be taken to move uh, forward. But if you look at the measures, I think there are three pillars which are really important. The first one is we need urgently to address equality uh, of access for uh, biosimilars. And there an important point is the awareness and how do we drive access to information for prescribers, procurement and policymakers, because they really need to get the transparency to understand the benefit and the value of biosimilars for, for everyone. It's for prescribers, for patients, for healthcare systems, but also to develop policies and, and also guidelines when it comes to treatment, when it comes to prevention, early detection, to really improve uh, treatment outcomes when it comes to those uh, biologic treatments. And another pillar which uh, we could also uh, encourage is the usage by driving incentive systems. And there we have also good examples coming from, for example, from Italy, but also from France, where we talk about the gain sharing model, which means that if you use biosimilars, part of the savings are gonna be reallocated to your hospital, your hospital department, or even you as a prescribing physician, which of course could be another measure to take to drive adoption of biosimilars. And the last one is really absolutely core, which is that we need to develop innovative, smart and uh, sustainable procurement. And here we need to move away. I mean, we see many cases still, the winner takes it all, which means there is only one company at the end who is being selected to um, deliver the biosimilars. And I think we need a healthy competition and also take the learnings from small molecules. Because if you look at the generics, we see in many countries uh, tenders being focused just on price only. And, and looking what happened, what was the result is a lot of consolidation and offshoring. And I think that's something we need to urgently avoid when we talk about biosimilars. So most probably there is not one size fits all. I would rather say uh, we need to find the best solution based on country needs and also the situation in each of the countries. But if you ask me about principle based, um, then I would say free and fair competition based on the level, level playing field um, so that everyone has the opportunity to play. So Sandoz, your company, Rebecca, pioneered the first biosimilars 15 years ago. You've been with the company almost all that time since the birth of biosimilars. What's it like being on that journey? How exciting is it? 
Well, it's truly exciting because it's, uh, if we talk about biosimilars, it's spot on our purpose, driving access to affordable medicines across the globe. And I think what is exciting to see is that, of course, the adoption rate has increased quite dramatically. And Europe is a success story where, when it comes to regulatory paths, but also how physicians and prescribers have adopted the usage of biosimilars. So looking ahead, there's much more to come. We know that there's a lot of products coming off patents. And I think what is important, the measures and uh, decisions we're gonna take now are gonna determine the success and sustainability of biosimilars. So unlocking the full potential ahead is, is what really excites me and I think gives the entire organization a lot of energy. So an exciting but challenging journey ahead. Rebecca Gunton, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.